Welcome to The Progressive Presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, an interactive U.S. history tutorial for students like you. In this two-part tutorial, you'll learn in detail about Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States, who served from 1901 to 1909. You'll learn how Roosevelt became an accidental president after the assassination of his predecessor, but transformed the office with a dynamic, progressive agenda. You'll learn how the president developed a reputation as a trust buster as he attempted to regulate and restrain the excesses of American industry. You'll learn how Roosevelt offered a square deal to the American people. And you'll learn how he forged perhaps his greatest legacy in the area of conservation. Before we learn about President Roosevelt in detail, let's review the progressive era in American history. Progressivism is associated with an era spanning from about 1890 to 1920, although those dates aren't exact. The root word of progressive, of course, is progress, and that's exactly what progressives wanted to achieve. They wanted to make progress by fixing the problems they saw around them. The Gilded Age that had followed the Civil War had been a time of national expansion and wealth, but for progressives it also created immorality, inequality, and corruption in all areas of society. So the progressive movement sought solutions for the problems of individuals, cities, and the nation as a whole. Progressivism was never a single unified movement, but it was more like a wide umbrella over various reform movements that included Americans of all regions, races, parties, and classes. Some progressives were prohibitionists who wanted to ban alcohol. Others were suffragettes who wanted to amend the Constitution to give women the right to vote. Some were social reformers who wanted to help the urban poor. Others were political reformers who wanted to end the corrupt political machines that dominated big cities. Some progressives were conservationists who wished to preserve the environment. And others still were trust busters who wanted to break up monopolies and the big businesses who owned them. How did they hope to fix these problems? Broadly speaking, progressives believed in using the power of government to achieve the reforms they desired. Government, they believed, could be the ultimate problem solver. In this way, progressivism was a departure from prior American history. In the past, Americans had favored a smaller government that did little but interfered little and cost taxpayers even less. This would change in the progressive era. By its end, the United States would have a larger federal government that would play a much more active role in people's lives and in the life of the nation. Most progressive reforms started at the grassroots or local level before they eventually came to dominate the national politics of the United States. Eventually, progressivism found a president who truly embraced its ideas, Theodore Roosevelt. In 1901, Republican President William McKinley began his second term as president of the United States. He had been re-elected the previous year. In his first term, McKinley had overseen a successful war with Spain and had expanded America's overseas empire. In September 1901, President McKinley went to greet the public and shake hands at the Pan American Exposition, a World's Fair held in Buffalo, New York. One of the men standing in line to meet him was an angry young anarchist, Leon Jolgosh, with a concealed weapon in his hand. When it was his turn to meet McKinley, instead of shaking his hand, Joel Gosh shot the president twice. William McKinley initially seemed like he would recover, but he died eight days later. Vice President Theodore Roosevelt was immediately sworn in as the new president. Roosevelt was the very definition of an accidental president. Before becoming vice president just six months earlier, he was one of the best-known heroes of the Spanish-American War and had served as governor of New York. But Roosevelt was seen as too controversial and unpredictable, not to mention too young to ever be elected president on his own. Even in his own Republican Party, many considered him a loose cannon or a damned cowboy. In fact, he had been chosen as McKinley's running mate in part because some in the Republican Party had wanted to keep him away from real government power. Now, Theodore Roosevelt was the president and in a position to make history. He promised to keep McKinley's cabinet and to continue the former president's policies. 
But Roosevelt would soon reveal himself to be a new kind of president, an active, energetic leader determined to use government power to achieve progressive goals. In one of his first addresses to Congress, Roosevelt explained that the Constitution as written at the nation's founding did not address many of the problems facing modern Americans. The conditions are now wholly different and wholly different action is called for. The year he became president, Theodore Roosevelt wrote to a friend about an absolutely vital question, whether or not the government has the power to control the trusts. Trusts were a controversial issue when Roosevelt assumed office, and they had been for some time. They were enormous businesses that controlled all or most of one part of the economy, creating a monopoly or a near monopoly. Trusts had formed during the Gilded Age because there had been no laws preventing their formation. Since they faced little or no competition, trusts were free to charge higher prices for goods which hurt consumers. Many progressives felt that the trust's owners, a handful of America's wealthiest businessmen, had far too much power over the economy and the nation. Back in 1890, Congress had passed the Sherman Antitrust Act to try and solve this problem. It gave the federal government powers to investigate and, in some cases, file lawsuits to break up trusts. But the Sherman Act had not been used as intended. In fact, ten years after its passage, it had been used more often to break up labor unions than monopolies. This changed under Theodore Roosevelt. Just months into his first term, his administration sued the Northern Securities Company, a trust which controlled most of the railroads in the American Northwest. One of the men who had created it was J.P. Morgan, the wealthy financier who had helped form General Electric, U.S. Steel, and AT&T. Like other captains of industry at the time, Morgan was used to operating somewhat above the law. Send your man to my man and they can fix it up, he told Roosevelt, as if the president was another businessman with whom he could negotiate. Roosevelt was unimpressed. Unlike previous presidents, he believed that government was not the partner of business, but should control business, at least when it worked against the interests of American consumers. The government won its case against Northern Securities, and the trust was split into several smaller railroads. Newspapers called the president Teddy the Trust Buster, and the Detroit Free Press joked that Wall Street is paralyzed at the thought that a president of the United States would sink so low as to try to enforce the law. Roosevelt would go on to prosecute 43 trusts under the Sherman Act, including John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil. President Roosevelt was a favorite subject of political cartoonists during his years in the White House. In truth, Roosevelt's trust-busting reputation was somewhat exaggerated. He did not seek newer, stronger antitrust laws, believing that the Sherman Act was sufficient if only if it were enforced. And he always preferred regulating trusts, passing laws to limit them or monitor them, rather than breaking them up entirely. The president was certainly not, at his core, anti-business. He believed in capitalism and the right of wealthy Americans to earn and keep their money. But he did bring a moralistic view to his role as overseer of the nation's economy. Roosevelt saw himself as targeting only the bad trusts, those that broke or skirted the laws, and leaving the good ones alone. And he felt fiercely protective of the American people, shielding them from what he considered the abuses of big business. This tendency can be seen in Roosevelt's handling of the coal strike of 1902. Almost 150,000 Pennsylvania miners went on strike in response to terrible working conditions. They wanted a pay raise, a reduction in their work hours, and recognition of their union, the United Mine Workers. Until then, they refused to do their jobs. The mine owners refused to negotiate. Throughout the summer and into the fall of 1902, little coal was mined in the Northeast. As winter approached and the strike went on, people started to panic. Coal was needed to heat America's homes, businesses, hospitals, and schools. People would die without it. Theodore Roosevelt had had enough. He decided to resolve the dispute personally and requested that the leaders of both sides come to Washington, D.C. Although Roosevelt was frustrated with both labor and management, he was especially enraged by the wooden-headed obstinacy and stupidity of the mine owners. He said about their spokesman, but not to his face, that he wanted to pick him up by the seat of his breeches and chuck him out a window.
He even threatened to have the government seize the mines and reopen them with federal troops supplying the labor. It's unlikely that Roosevelt would have carried through on this threat, or even legally been able to, but it proved unnecessary. Both sides agreed to arbitration, in which a commission of outside experts reached a compromise agreeable to everyone. President Roosevelt named several of the commission's members. In the end, the miners won some of the demands they were seeking, and the mine owners did not technically have to recognize the workers' union. The coal mines reopened in time for winter. Theodore Roosevelt may not have resolved the coal strike single-handedly, but his willingness to get involved formed a striking contrast with previous presidents, who considered it simply not their job to intervene in labor crises. Proud of himself, Roosevelt said that he had only tried to give both sides a square deal. The name stuck. The square deal became Roosevelt's name for his domestic agenda going forward and his slogan when he ran for re-election in 1904. As a progressive president, Theodore Roosevelt was concerned with regulating aspects of society that he felt worked against and not for the average American. The idea that the U.S. government should have anything to do at all with the private sector was still a new and controversial idea. But Roosevelt believed that some government oversight and control of private industries, like the railroads, was necessary for the good of the nation. In the early 20th century, automobiles were a novelty and railroads still bound the U.S. together. Although the U.S. economy depended on rail transportation, the railroads were private businesses concerned with their own profits, not for the public good. The result was that businesses and individuals were at the mercy of the railroads, which could charge whatever rates they wanted. And big business looked after big business. Sometimes large volume customers like Rockefeller Standard Oil would pay reduced rates or even get free passes, while the small farmers who could least afford to often paid the highest rates. For these reasons, railroad reform had been sought by progressives for more than a decade. Before Roosevelt, however, little progress had been made. An 1887 law had created the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC, to regulate railroads that crossed state lines, but its powers were limited. In 1906, Roosevelt convinced Congress to pass the Hepburn Act, the regulation of the railroads that progressives sought. The law let the ICC set maximum rates for the railroads, as well as end the discriminatory practices that gave discounts to some customers, but not to others. It even let the ICC view the railroad's financial records, a glimpse behind the scenes into the workings of some of America's biggest businesses. The law was a turning point in federal control over a private industry. In the 19th century, the U.S. government had practiced a laissez-faire attitude that allowed industries largely to do as they pleased without federal interference. Now, under progressive presidents like Roosevelt, Industry in the 20th century would find itself more and more subject to government scrutiny and regulation. It should be noted that Roosevelt was not simply hostile to big businesses. In some ways, he viewed regulation as a halfway step better than the alternative, which was socialism. Some socialists and populists wanted the government to completely take over the railroads and run them on the people's behalf. Roosevelt would never have agreed with such a move. He simply wanted a somewhat fairer version of the system that already existed, a square deal. Young, energetic, and passionate about reform, Theodore Roosevelt was a different kind of president than most who had come before him. He spoke of the presidency as a bully pulpit, an old-fashioned term for a wonderful platform or stage from which he could push for his agenda. Roosevelt believed that when the president spoke, people listened. Those who helped him get his message out included the media. Roosevelt cultivated a close relationship with many reporters, inviting them into the White House and holding frequent press conferences, sometimes in the middle of his afternoon shave. Journalism was undergoing a revolution in the early 20th century. Many reporters were no longer content to passively report the day's news. Instead, they became investigative journalists making it their business to expose government corruption and social injustice. Roosevelt had a complicated relationship with these reporters. He considered them partners in selling his progressive agenda to the public, but he thought they sometimes went too far. 
Roosevelt called the most provocative reporters muckrakers, as if they took pleasure in raking through society's muck or dirt. One journalist who formed a key partnership with the president was Upton Sinclair, a young socialist and proud muckraker. When Roosevelt became president, no one inspected the quality of food or medicines except the companies who made them. As a result, these companies frequently put profit above public health, shipping customers products that were sometimes contaminated, even poisonous. It was especially well known that America's meatpacking industry needed regulation and reform. To prove it, Upton Sinclair went undercover as a worker in Chicago's infamous slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants. Sinclair fictionalized his experiences and published them in a novel called The Jungle, a story of immigrants struggling to survive in the big city. The book, which became a bestseller, stunned the nation. Sinclair wrote of spoiled meat treated with chemicals to remove its stench and sold as new. He described the rats, filth, diseased animals, and even human body parts that made their way into the nation's meat supply and onto Americans' dinner tables. One of the many Americans who read The Jungle was Theodore Roosevelt. He called Upton Sinclair a crackpot, but he shared the author's disgust at the meat industry and realized that it was ripe for regulation. Roosevelt invited Sinclair to the White House, where the two launched an independent probe to investigate the book's charges. The president's team of investigators reported back that the stories reported by Sinclair in The Jungle were largely accurate. But what could be done? As it stood, there were virtually no federal laws that gave the government the right to interfere with or even to monitor the meat industry. This is where Theodore Roosevelt used the power of the bully pulpit to make a progressive change. He published his own team's findings for the public to read and sent them to the House of Representatives, demanding that Congress pass strict rules on meat inspection. Congress yielded to the president and to public outrage and passed not only the first Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906, but also the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Government would now be in charge of inspecting and guaranteeing the quality of food, drink, and medicine. One senator who voted for the bills called them the most pronounced extension of federal power in every direction ever enacted. And President Roosevelt declared that this Congress has done more substantive work for good than any Congress has done at any session since I became familiar with public affairs.